And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. I met a, a man of, of many forms of SF. And, and is the current developer of the upcoming Tangent Space RPG, because we, because the world needs a little bit more space opera, with or without Queen, probably with. The one and only J.P. Starcy. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. So it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind... I'd like you to walk me through your, through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh, goodness. Uh, so, it really started in uh, a less than positive way, actually. I kind of struggled with the genre at first because I had friends that were uh, a little flighty about it, so they kept showing me these different systems, but they never really wanted to stick with any one of them, so... I was kind of confused at first. I didn't really understand what was going on, but then I met someone who was really into a homebrewed version of Mekton Zeta. So when uh, I finally got to sit down and actually learn a system, I got really hooked. I mean, I just, I got really into it. I was, you know, I thought it was really fun how flexible it was compared to like the video games and stuff I'd always been playing. So yeah, as soon as I kind of, got a chance to sit down with someone who wasn't going to bounce from one system to the next, I actually uh, learned it and got, got really hooked into the entire genre. It's interesting that... Um, now, I, there, as often as I've done this kind of thing, there are certain commonalities you, you end up hearing when it comes to what the, what um, what was somebody, what was somebody's first game. You know, you usually hear some form of D&D or, or, some, or sometimes World of Darkness... Sometimes, um, sometimes Middle Earth role play, but Mechton Zeta it, as somebody's first is a new one. <laughs> did you? Did um, <laughs> were you familiar at all with 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 Mech? Where did you have? Did you get the weeb bug early on, or did you have to have the idea of giant ass robots explained to you? Uh, no, I'd I'd uh, seen like a uh, uh, Robotech and. Gundam, I'd seen it. I mean, I wasn't a super fan, but I liked it. I thought it was interesting. And so it wasn't too hard for me to get into Mechton, especially since a lot of the campaigns that we did, because it was so heavily homebrewed, they actually expanded on a lot of the character level stuff. So while there was giant mecha robots, there was a lot more character stuff as well. So it almost played a little more traditionally in that sense, as in the, the mecha robots weren't the center point of the story. Yeah. Which... Maybe a blessing and a curse because of how, because of how batshit insane Mechton Zeta can really get. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Back then, I struggled very much with uh, keeping complicated rules straight, and oh my goodness, the actual combinations of things made my head spin. <laughs> Lord help you. If, well, this is where you should count your blessings that your first and that your first entry wasn't the Aliens um, RPG. Not the one that's been out recently. That one's good. I'm talking about the one from from like 15 years ago. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that one, but uh, I've heard people talk about some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, like I, uh, I did play briefly in a uh, GURPS game, and I was lost. <laughs> the funny thing about GURPS is when you get down to brass tacks and actually rolling, actually rolling the die, GURPS isn't all that complicated. It's the character creation where people end up running off screaming. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, very lost. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, and of course, I've, I've made the joke that anybody who wants to try and have vehicles in GURPS needs to break out their old TI-83s that they haven't touched since high school. Oh man, is it that bad? <laughs> okay, it's, it's, not th it's not that bad, but the, prob the problem is... When you're tr when you're trying to develop essentially a universal system, there's you have to try you have to try and take account for as many things as humanly possible, and 
that's that's why universal systems will always um always lean one of two, one of two possibilities either crunchy or really either really crunchy or really light there is no in between that makes sense oh the the um poster child for a really light universal would be something like say fate um okay whereas the really crunchy end of things would be stuff like gurps or um hero system okay um and a lot of that crunch is just in like creation but when it comes to ta when it comes to tangent space um now you now you've put up on your profile that you're a big sf nerd um yes and given that you describe it as um cap of capturing scope and optimism would it be fair of me to assume that you lean more towards trek than wars lean yes but i can appreciate both yeah um I mean, obviously, anybody can appreciate both. Is but it's more of just because just because you can catch with both hands doesn't doesn't mean that you're all doesn't mean that you're always going to catch with with either hand, unless you're truly right. ambidextrous. Yes, definitely. Star Trek was always much bigger factor in my childhood, so it it holds a special place in my heart. Um, with that in mind, do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember what series was your breaking in when it came to Star Trek? Oh, uh, that's hard because uh, I was introduced to both the original series movies and the Next Generation pretty much at the same time, so I couldn't really say which one was first. <laughs> I'd probably count it as a, as a continuum in that case, and I'm ho I'm hoping that they didn't. I'm hoping that you didn't get broken in with the first movie because my sympathies. I was enraptured by the first movie when I was a kid. I know, it was crazy, right? But I did. I was one of those rare kids that had an attention span, and I was just enraptured by the visuals, and and I was terrified of the scary V'ger robot. <laughs> um, I mean, I, there are cer there are certainly there are certainly worse there are certainly um, worse films in Trek to be to um, get your to get your introduction out of, like Five, for instance. Um. But yeah. <laughs> look, that look that's gonna count as that's gonna count as my cheap shot for the day. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, but it is, but but that that kind of approach doesn't surprise me, and it was probably and it was probably you probably got introduced to um to Trek to um TNG after the um bad years, i.e. the first two seasons. Uh no, I I saw all of it. Uh, it was uh mostly just what my parents recorded on old VHS tapes. So I would just watch the VHS tapes over and over again, and I didn't understand the continuity, but you didn't really need to with TNG because it was so episodic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just kind of noticed like, wow, their uniforms look really bad in this episode. I wonder what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's the the first two the first two seasons of TNG are not are not well liked because um G, because Gene was trying to do TOS um again and, yeah. again except two except thing one things had changed and two he was trying to, he was trying way too hard to to um to to portray an attitude that I have found laughable when I was a kid and I still find laughable to this day the whole Starfleet is not a military thing. And it clearly is. It's just they're really trying not to sell it as one. <laughs> um, the problem, which is, is why I really appreciated, you know, which Deep is, Space Nine. There, uh, well, I, I like Deep Space Nine for for a lot of reasons. One, one is the the least of which is that Ron Moore is probably one of the best writers of that of that era because he was one person who was willing to challenge Gene and the like on their assumptions. Um, a case in point. If you remember the episode from TNG, um, Family, that was all about Picard on shore leave, um, even though that episode was very well received, Gene hated it. <laughs> like he, he absolutely, he absolutely despised it because he was still high up on that whole no conflict amongst the crew kind of thing. Um, the yeah. It's possible to have a very optimistic and positive view on the future without necessarily ignoring just normal relationships between people. Mm -hmm. And 
some of some of his ed some of his edicts like that are caused a lot of friction among um, writers. But and of of course, when it comes to DS Nine, the other the other th the other thing it had in his favor is Ben motherfucking Cisco. <laughs> yes, once uh, the hair moved from the top of his head down to his chin, things got real. The funny thing the funny thing is from the stories that I had that I had been told over the years, he actually wanted to he actually wanted to go bald earlier than he did. The reason why he why he was told not to is because they thought he would look scary. <laughs> Which I can't completely fault them for that. Especially Is this the whole mirror universe goatees thing? <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> I just I just find it kind I just find it kind of hilarious that that was the reason given when he does have a history of intimidating people up to and including a Klingon who could probably break his neck without even trying. Yeah, yeah, Cisco is uh, definitely not the uh, most diplomatic of the captains, but that's perfectly fine. No, he's he's perfectly diplomatic. It's just that his dip. It's just that he only knows. It's just that his language of diplomacy is the is the language of punch. Hey, it worked on it, Q. Q got hit <laughs> once and he never came back. <laughs> that that's actually a very valid comp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never saw it that way, but you're right. <laughs> whereas he whereas he tor whereas he tormented um, Picard for se for seven years. Probably why he doesn't spend much time around Klingons. Probably, probably not. Um, there's, al there's, al there's also the fact that he pro that he pr that he probably heard one too many speeches about uh, about honor and wishes he could die just from it, just from it, so he could escape it. <laughs> um, even though, but that, uh, but that does bring me to, to tangent. So. The core was the core idea. Was the core kernel of the idea. Um, you you're you trying to do your own spin your own spin on that kind of um, optimistic future that we'd that we'd see in Trek, or what, were there other influences? Um, Trek was a big influence, but I, it definitely wasn't the only one. I also uh, eventually got very much into like Babylon Five, so I ended up really loving the interstellar drama side of space opera because that one vibe is all drama <laughs> and uh i uh, eventually when the mass effect series came out i got super into that one and so i just realized that i really like these types of worlds and stories where it's it's showing a future for humanity that isn't broken and dirty and unhappy and just miserable you know mm -hmm. um the and since you mentioned mass effect i'm go i'm go i'm going to guess you were as you were as pissed off about the ending to three as everybody else was <laughs> not really because i didn't actually get to the ending of it until after they did the revision to it where it made a little more sense but from what i heard from what it was originally it just kind of stopped yeah, I um, I did a I did a whole episode of the podcast not too long ago called Mass Effect and the Curse of Choice, where I highlighted that the that um the brick wall that they were going to end up running into was laid long be long before three even came out. Um, but I don't know if a video game can even really truly capitalize on what they were trying to do. I mean, there's only so much a video game can do when it comes to branching paths and options and choices and things. This is why I love tabletop gaming, because you don't have those restrictions. Um, it's funny you mention that, because I, rem I, remember, I remember watching a presentation of all the branching choices in, a, in Alpha Protocol, which is complete jank, but I have a soft spot for. And... If you were to look at the if you were to look at the possible choices just from one scene, it would look like a tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> um, where you have a set of choices and then all the possible reactions, and that was just for one scene. And the the guy the guy doing the um, presentation said, "This was two months of my fucking life." Um, 
So th there's definitely there's definitely a point with that. I don't. I um. I'm a little less inclined to give Bioware slack for it because th because of the comments after the fact that if they did a big boss fight that it would be too video gamey, and I'm sitting here going, "You're making a video game." What the? Yeah. Heck? Yeah. Plus, there was that whole um. There was that whole dark matter um thing that got leaked from the original script, which I'm not gonna say was would have been better, but it couldn't have been worse. Yeah. Uh but I, I can definitely see that I can definitely see that kind of um that kind of approach, especially since it's it seems that if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you kinda ha you kinda have a a um a setup where you have the core the core worlds that that are mostly idyllic and the frontier where the rules are more like suggestions. Yes, very much so. So it's the core world. Core, core worlds are basically turning into a utopia. It's it's not perfect yet, but it's all signs are pointing towards this is going to be, you know, utopian butterflies and rainbows, mm. basically. But the further away from those core worlds you get, the less you see that. And until finally, when you're out on the frontier. A lot of those places, they're still bringing a lot of those principles and ideas with them because they colonized those frontier worlds from the core systems, most likely. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to maintain that when you're going from post-scarcity to how are we going to feed ourselves on this brand new planet? <laughs> yeah, and science fiction is a science fiction. It when it comes to developing a setting within that particular genre. It can be best described as a series of questions, and those quest and the answers to those questions provide even provide even more questions. Um, one of the one of the big one of the big ones that I think is always go always going to come up is where is where humans stand in in the setting. Because so all right, I can definitely go into yeah the uh, the human side of this. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Essentially, humanity has solved the vast majority of its issues and struggles that it had back on old Earth, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they've uh, all come together into an organization called the Terran Union. And they all refer to themselves as Terrans, as a uh, symbol of solidarity. Mm -hmm. So as they're going out to all these different planets, they all call themselves Terrans, even though they have various different origins and their cultures have diverged even more than they already have on our own home world mm -hmm. so uh they've they've uh, come together and become this galactic superpower and it happened very quickly that's actually one of the uh highlights of humanity is how quickly we actually advance sometimes we advance faster than we can handle it <laughs> yeah. um part of the reason i bring that up because you met you you uh, met, you've mentioned Babylon Five and Mass Effect, and in both of those cases, humanity's position within the within um, within interracial politics is complicated, <laughs> to put to put it lightly. Uh, yes, once it becomes down to politics with the other factions, the other uh, space nations, things do get a lot more complicated. But uh, so far. Uh, humanity has done pretty good at representing itself to the alien neighbors, and they were a big factor in forming basically the Space UN, as my uh, friends like to call it, the Star League. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so they basically depends on which species you're talking about. Like, one of them straight up tried to vassalize humanity, but it didn't go that well, and the other was like, no, we shouldn't really interact with them at all. <laughs> But I'm I'm guessing that because I'm guessing that because of how rapidly humanity went humanity went from from uh, the from their more from their old Earth days to the, to the um state to the current state with the Union, a lot of the other races see them as upstarts. Uh, they actually have shown a lot of respect for them because of how effectively they were able to spread out through the area of space that they control the orion spur mm -hmm. it's they did it in the amount of time that they were able to spread out and actually establish themselves as a player on the galactic stage mm -hmm. 
was so much faster than everyone else around them that everyone kind of had to step back and go, whoa, these, these, the species just came out of nowhere and look what they've already done. So they're a, a bit of a curiosity and uh, they've actually, uh, so it's, it's a very, it's, it's kind of meant to be a positive outlook on the role of humanity that once we actually get our shit together, mm-hmm. we can accomplish amazing things. Yeah. Now, one of the other major questions that I've asked frequently whenever I'm dealing with a space opera setting is um, the nature of FTL travel. And there's usually, there's usually, t- FTL travel in science fiction usually falls within one of two major categories with a little, with a little bit of leeway, like a Venn diagram. On one end, of, on one end of the of the spectrum, you have these. You have e- engines that tend to go into some kind of sub, some kind of subspace for the, for their FTL travel, and you and uh, because of that, they can do they can jump into they can jump into FTL from and from anywhere in space. On the uh, on the other hand, you have the you have um, spe- specified point approaches. Um, Stuff like Mass Effect, stuff like Wing Commander would fall into this, where you can only go into FT- FTL mode at specific coordinates. Where does Tangent Space fit into that particular um, alignment? So it definitely leans closer to the not restricted in where you can do it side of things, mm-hmm. but not entirely, as in it's not reliable enough that people are willing to do it too terribly close to gravity wells so similar to uh like what star wars does where they you know say they you don't do well old star wars anyway would not do it near uh gravity well we're we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about disney star wars i'm in a good mood right now (laughs) but uh essentially (laughs) the uh way that uh fashion life travels works is that the speed of light actually is an absolute but they found a way to cheat. And the way that they cheat is they discovered what is called fifth dimensional physics, which is essentially there is a fifth dimension of physical space time that is completely invisible to most people until you discover it. And that is the hyperspace subspace area, which is hyperspace is infinite expansion and subspace is infinite contraction. Mm-hmm. So going into subspace, the universe is actually getting smaller. But your relative position is exactly the same as it is back in your normal layer. Yeah. So going into subspace, the deeper you go, the smaller the universe. You move two inches and pop back up, you move two light years. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to that kind of system, obviously, um, Star Trek has had has had their le- has had their levels of warp, and um, until Voyager came along and decided and decided to do something monumentally stupid with it, because I'm not letting I'm not letting threshold go. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, if you say if you say that going warp ten is a theoretical impossibility, then it should be impossible. Not impossible because you because you don't have the right tech. No, it's imp. There's a difference between a mechanical impossibility and a theoretical impossibility. Yeah, well, that's Voyager for you. Had a lot of interesting ideas, but continuity they did not know the meaning of that word. <laughs> there's there's an old in, there's an old interview that Ron Moore did about his uh, on um, El Cars about his experience with um, with Voyager the one. With the two episodes that he did for that um, Equinox two-parter, he did not have a pleasant experience working with br- working with um, Braga. Yeah, I'm. I'm just glad that a lot of TV is actually moving towards a more serialized format, where what happened in one episode will affect what happens in the next. <laughs> Unlike Voyager, which gets almost entirely destroyed in one episode, in the very next episode, they're back to normal. I'm like, what? <laughs> you were limping along like five minutes ago. Um, I a lot a lot of that a lot of that is due to Ber- to Berman and, and Braga, the two the two headed mo- the two headed monster behind most bad Trek. Um, 
Plus, it, pl although on the plus side, it let me do the shuttle drinking game. Take a shot. Every, take a shot every time. Every time they use a shuttle. They're putting those industrial replicators to good use, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and, pe and I th and people thought it was bleeding edge to do the whole self-replicating mines thing. No wonder they had to keep rationing their food because they kept using all their energy to replicate new shuttles and torpedoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But now, when it come, now, one of the other things that I found that I found I found kind of interesting is the use of psionics that you that you have in it. Now, obviously, psionics and science fiction is one of those things that's been going ha that's been going hand in hand since. I want to, I want to say the um I want to say the 50s um going all, going all the way back to stuff like I robot and the robots of dawn which wasn't the first case but it was it was the um it's definitely one of the early examples of putting in mental powers into science fiction um and there's been there's been multiple approaches to approaches to it whether you have the the um psych the telepaths in Babylon 5 of course you have biotics in Mass Effect you have um, unofficial, unofficial psychic use with certain races in Star Trek. Um, what sort of approach were you going with when it came to mental powers with tangent space? Is it a new phenomenon, or is it something that's that's variably understood by the different races? So, psionics is very integral in the into the actual history of the galaxy, in that. It is eventually discovered that all consciousness is psionic in in nature, and once the, so that was the main reason why people could never really understand consciousness and how does the mind work is because there was a major component that had not yet been discovered, which was psionics or the etheric field, mm -hmm. and so that discovery naturally leads a species down a psionic path or it would have if it weren't for the precursors the precursors deliberately stunted the psionic development of almost every species in the galaxy yeah. now i've in i've seen in some i've seen in some settings where um where site where um there's a kind of othering when it comes to when it comes to people who have psionics, especially in in human and in some non-human societies. Um, the affirm in the aforementioned case of Babylon Five, you have to be registered as a telepath, otherwise you'd have people like the Psychor after you, and prop and probably not for probably not to do lunch. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, let's be real, Psychor, they were assholes. <laughs> well. Although give give it some credit, we don't know. I didn't often get to see Walter Koenig play a villain. Yeah, that's true. He did a very good job as Bester. He you genuinely hated that guy every time he came up, mm -hmm. and you're like, "But wait, no, it's Chekhov. I don't hate him entirely." <laughs> Prob I think he probably just wanted to vent after after having suffered through Moon Trap. Right, I'm not familiar with that one. Um. He was playing opposite a young Bruce Campbell, which, uh -huh. so, which sounds awesome, but um, <laughs> this is n this is not e this is not um, kitsch, chiseled chin Bruce Campbell. <laughs> this is oh yeah, I just looked up some pictures. It's uh, a little campy looking, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little ca it's a little campy looking, but the unfortunate problem is that it's um, it doesn't embrace its camp. Oh no! So it's really campy, but it's trying not to be. Yeah. Oh no! Which is the, which oh, that's the worst. In your when you have that kind of thing, you're in a you're in a special kind of hell where you're bad, but you're not bad enough. Like something something like um. Star um, I brought I brought up I brought up Star Trek Five earlier, and Star Trek Five is bad. But at least I can poke. At least I can poke fun at how ridiculously stupid it gets. Um, the something like Samurai Cop is objectively a bad film, but you can you can bring some friends together to drink and laugh at at its stupidity. And unfor unfortunately, Moontrap just isn't bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
which is probably why which is probably why so many people forgot about it. Yeah. But but back to your uh question, it was about uh people kind of othering psionics. Uh that doesn't really happen too terribly much. I mean, it might happen on certain planets based on their own history of with psionics, but in general, psionics are a major focus of research for a lot of people to try and figure out what causes someone to go from just being a normal person to all of a sudden having mind powers. Yeah. And so, uh, and the people trying to figure out why does it not happen as frequently? Like one of the species, the Elkari, every single member of their species is psionic. Mm-hmm. Well, with some very few exceptions, but for the most part, we're talking like 95% of their population is psionic. And so there's this big question in the galaxy of why some and not others? If all consciousness is psionic, what's the inhibiting factor? Mm-hmm. Um, and when you mention inhibiting factor, one of the things that immediately came to mind is um, is the is the kind of anti-psychics that are in um, Warhammer 40,000, also known as blanks, or in some cases, pariahs. Um, is is some is something like is something like that present, or do you or do you leave that up to the GMs? Uh, so you're talking about people that are immune to it. Um, it would be pe- a in um in. I'm not. I'm gonna give the cliff notes on this, but in 40k, a blank is some is somebody who completely does not register in the in the psionic network known as the warp. Um, like people who would, who would usually use psionics to see, literally can't see them. As far as they're concerned, they don't exist. Uh, no. If if that were to happen, they're usually, they have something that's blocking it. Mm-hmm. Because in this setting, all consciousness is psionic, so if you have absolutely no reading psionically, either you're not alive, or so you're using something to block that. Yeah. Um, now, some something else I'm curious about is the status of machines and artificial intelligence. Um, okay. Because obvious, obviously, when it, whenever you're dealing with a speculative future, that's some, that's something that's going to be under a heavy amount of debate and discussion. And sometimes, sometimes you have cases where it's highly regulated, like the like the whole AI VI distinction in Mass Effect, sometimes it's not as much of a factor. Um, what's the set? What's the setup for that for artificial life in um, tangent space? So there are definitely two very distinct categories. Mm-hmm. There's robotics, and then there is true sapient AI. Robotics is everywhere, and it comes in varying levels of intelligence, but Robotics never reach the level of sapience where they're actually considered a person. However, once you get into true AI, the only way to actually make a true AI is to use very specific techniques that are currently a secret held only by the Pandorans, which are an AI species themselves. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes now when it comes to the brass tacks of of mechanics and character creation and the like. There's a there there's a couple of things I, w- I wanted to open up with. One is, unless I'm a, is I find it ve- I find it very interesting that you're using a variable die size approach, where d8 where you're rolling d8s as the default, but you would, but the die size would change depending on how easy or difficult the action is. What, Correct. What um. What w- what was your inspiration for doing this ca- for doing this kind of system, and what um, what sort of what sort of setup are you trying to in- are you trying to encourage with it? So one of the main factors for when I was designing the actual mechanics of the game was I wanted I wanted math to be there where it needed to be, and I wanted to simplify or remove it where it didn't need to be. Mm-hmm. So I wanted it to be intuitive. So the dice size system makes it really easy for a game master to just tell a player that's asking, can I do this crazy thing? Yeah, you can do that, but it's going to be more difficult. 
Mm. So your dice is going to go down a size. And it's really easy. You could just throw it out there. You don't have to worry about the numerical ramifications of what you just told them. They can just go down a size, roll it, and done. <laughs> so, and it also makes it easy for players to assist each other. So, like, this is an impossible action for one person to do. It's just too difficult. But if three people are working together, they can overcome those negatives with positives. And now you're rolling with a decent enough chance of success with three people helping. Mm hmm. Now, the other thing I the other thing I find interesting is that un unless I'm misreading this, tangent space is a purely skill based system. There is no attribute skill relation um dichotomy that you that is kind that is kind of the standard in a lot of games. Um, yes, that the decision to drop attributes was just kind of just came to me all of a sudden because I was struggling with them. I was really trying to figure out what attributes do I want to use? What do I want to tie them to? And just it suddenly just came to me that I don't think I need them. So I just dropped the attributes entirely, and I just said, skills themselves will have levels associated with them. Mm -hmm. So if you are mastered in this skill, you're going to do better at someone who has never done this skill before in their life. Yeah. So it just kind of came together really nicely, and it cut out a lot of the math that goes into tabletop games, which mm. I'm not against math, I just don't think it needs to be everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um something something else that I um that I know that I found that I found interesting in that further is having having separate um categories of experience. And in a weird way this this kind of thing reminded me of games like um basic role playing which is used in um Call of Cthulhu and RuneQuest um where you, where um you're tr where you're leveling up skills d directly through through their own through um ex through an experience setup granted in that case you have you have to roll over your per your percentile but is it but with the experience setup that you have for skills is it a case where using the skill grants you an op grants you the option to get experience so the way experience works is uh well so far the base to start hold on let me get back to the beginning <laughs> the dice system is based on how well you beat rolls so Whenever you are comparing the, your role against the target or your role against the opposing role, how well you beat a role is very important, not just the fact that you beat it. Beating someone by five or more is considered a direct hit. When you get a direct hit, you get a point of experience in the same category as the skill you just used. Mm -hmm. So say you fired a gun and got a direct hit, you just got a point of martial experience. Now let's say you fired that gun and failed, you actually get two experience for failing. And would it be would it be correct on me if to assume that once you get a certain number of experience, you can level up a skill? Correct. Once you get the ten experience points, you can level up any skill in that category. Yeah. Now, when I look at skill entries, there's a couple there's a couple of things I find interesting. One of them is the. Um, is the fact that you kind of have a you kind of have a action suite that almost could be um, printed off on its own on its own little card. Uh, that's uh, actually something I've got in the works is uh, skill cards. <laughs> um, the but there's also there's also the fact that each one has a mastery entry. I'd like you to go into what what inspired th those particular setups. Uh, so I've always felt that the best way to make sure your players are having fun is to just let them feel like a badass. Just let them do it. Let them have that moment. And one of the best ways to give players that moment is to reward them for their efforts. So if somebody goes through the trouble of mastering one skill, that skill is obviously important to them and their vision for their character. So why not have that mastery come with some awesome benefit that only masters get? Which is an interesting thing to do, especially with a, especially with a skill based system, since a lot of um, sk a lot of skill use in RPGs, the there's not really a be there's not really a benefit to get to getting higher and higher skills aside from getting a getting a better aside from getting a better result. There isn't really a the there are certain endpoints, but skills themselves are not it. 
and the only um there's only a couple games I can think of that have some that had some degree of endpoint, and the big one that comes to mind for me right now is um fourth edition Legend of the Five Rings, where certain t certain thresholds of skills granted um mastery effects. Right, right. Yeah, and that's not even the only thing. It's just leveling up your uh, skills is important because they're not static in what they can do. So say you have the ignition skill, which basically lets you just set something on fire. You can hit it with a plasma bolt and it goes on fire. Mm -hmm. You can actually, if your skill is high enough, deliberately make your action more difficult to get more oomph out of it. So say I want to hit everybody in that room with a firebolt simultaneously. Well, now you've just changed your single target attack into an area attack. So that's going to make it more difficult. But if you're a master, I'll take the difficulty. It's fine. I can handle it. Mm -hmm. Now, I did see that on Twitter you put you had put up a brief thread going into how someone could um, theoretically create a XP of a um, Jedi. And yeah, <laughs> I'd um. I'd like to I'd like to pick your brain on on builds re regarding that since this is even though you have a set of archetypes those are those are essentially the um start the starting points more than anything else and I'm I'm pretty sure Yeah, I made those just to help new players who aren't familiar with the system not feel overwhelmed. Which <laughs> is which is a good move because when you have a setup that's this freeform um, the concept of choice paralysis can come up. It's something I've talked about. I've talked about oh, yeah. elsewhere, and I've run of, into it with my playtesters, so I knew I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, and a, a lot of um, a lot of games in the '90s had this had this problem, and they and the solution was um to steal a line from Penny Arcade: swim, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like thro like throwing somebody in the deep end, and just and just telling them and just telling them um now telling them just paddle. No, nah, I want to give them floaties. They can take the floaties off when they're ready. Um, <laughs> that's why you. That's why you got to put. Some, that's why you got to put somebody in the sh in the shallow pool before you throw them off the high dive. Right. Um. But I wanted to pick your brain when it came to when it came to build when it came to build when it came to build varieties and how you'd interpret them within um, tangent space. And some some of these will be dipping into pop culture because. Well, oh please if, do go right ahead. Well, if you're get, if you're gonna steal, you may as well steal from the best. So I'm um, so a few of these are gonna be um close to the best, I think. I hope I know the references to most of them. <laughs> All right, I'll start. I'll start with the I'll start with the Jedi one because I wanted to go into something a little more specific on that. So, okay. how familiar are you with the seven lightsaber forms? Uh, somewhat, because I hacked Mechton Zeta into Star Wars for one of my friends once, and it included all the Star Wars saber forms. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a lot of what I did back then, but I'm in general familiar with it. All right. So, so suppose somebody wanted to do a, a Jedi build, but they specifically wanted to be a Form 4 Adept. Okay, so you'll have to remind me what Form 4 is. Form 4 is Ataru, also known as the Way of the Hawk Bat. It tends to involve a lot of acrobatics, a lot of leaps. It has a lot in common with Wushu. Um, Yoda, it, Yoda, Yoda and Qui-Gon Jinn were both um, Form, form 4 um, experts. All right, so it sounds like with that, they're going to go pretty heavy into the athletic skill. They're probably going to master that, mm -hmm. which then would basically allow them to start uh, combining. So one of the modifications you can do to a skill, if you're skilled enough in it, is to reduce a full action into a half action. Mm -hmm. So they could start doing attacks at the same time as doing acrobatic flips and jumps and stuff. All right. Now... Suppose, suppose instead of suppose instead of form four, they went with um, form two, which is um, known as Makashi. Form two has a lot more in common with um, with European fencing. Um, this is the form that Count Dooku used, and the reason why he had those curved lightsabers so they could have more grip with just using a one-handed approach. 
Yeah, that's actually uh, one of the things I mentioned in that thread you mentioned, uh, is the dueling grip is actually something you can attach to a sword to give yourself a bonus to uh, parries and counters. And speaking of parries and counters, if you're going to go heavy into that direction, you're just going to want to you're going to want to master dueling as a skill, mm -hmm. and that's going to get you access to all sorts of really uh, powerful options when you're going uh, melee versus melee. Mm -hmm. Now, the last the last um, style example that I'll that'll go with in regard to this is someone going with um, form five, specifically the ladder um, for form five is a complicated one because it has two names, um, Xian and Gem So. Um, it's very much analogous to broadsword fencing or um, ke or kendo. Because it's more, it's instead of instead of being about pure defense like form three is, it's more about matching strength with strength. Okay. So uh, I'm just I, as you're saying these, I'm looking these up on Wiki Wikipedia real quick to refresh my memory. So it looks like it's also talking about uh, returning blaster bolts to their origin. Um. That's that's one aspect uh, that Xi'an did. Gem So didn't didn't do that. It was more oh, okay. it was more it was the more aggressive sister to it. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, okay. Um when um Vader used Gem So a lot. Alright, so if it's a very aggressive uh, then that's definitely going to be leaning more heavily into brandish than into dueling. Brandish is all about doing damage with your melee weapon, mm -hmm. and it actually lets you do wide sweeps to hit multiple targets. It's going to let you do execution strikes, which do critical damage on someone who can't defend themselves, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, now, sp stepping, out of, um, stepping out of the Star Wars end of things... Um, okay. I'd like I'd like to I'd like to go into um some into the an example of the Grammaton cleric from Equilibrium. A yes, pretty, a pretty un thank thank you for, thank you for being familiar with Equilibrium. That's going to make my job easier. <laughs> um, Gun Fu is so campy, but I love it. So of course I, I, I yeah of course. <laughs> I have spent way too much time watching John Woo movies for <clears throat> research. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, to the point that when I ad when I adapted Gun Fu in, w in one point, I put in a side rule that anytime someone gets a critical hit, pigeons fly in the air for no reason, even if you're in even if you're in a dungeon. Okay, that's definitely a stylistic choice. <laughs> I figure I figure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go if I'm gonna go style style with it, I I have to go completely ham at it. So you're always going for the pigeons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So Tetragram... Oh, man, if I can speak. Tetragrammaton Cleric. Gun Fu. Mm -hmm. So what you were then is you're going to be maximizing marksmen, but you're also going to be focusing on pistols instead of anything larger. And the thing about pistols is that they inherently give you a bonus to dual wield. Unlike modern pistols, where you never really want to do that, these sci-fi pistols, you can handle it. They're designed to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go with pistols. You're going to go with unarmed strikes. And uh, in fact, there, I think, thank you for mentioning this, because I almost forgot to add it. They're going to actually add a module that you can add to pistols to let them uh, add damage to unarmed attacks. Yeah. And so, yeah. When it... Speaking of speaking of firearms, before I get before I get to the next um, build idea, um, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to firearm setups, I mean, there's prob there's probably you probably have plans for a balance of solid projectile and, and energy weapons. I'm ge I'm guessing. Uh, it's it's separated into uh, seven different damage types. Mm -hmm. Oh. So kinetic, photon, particle, plasma, cryo, electric, and psionic. All right. Um, the second thing, the second thing I was going to ask is in regard to in regard to um, ammunition and reloading. Um, are some are some of them are some of them strictly on a clip based approach, or do, are some weapons more uh, more about um, heat management? Uh, so weapons, they function based on how much power they have, which is only tracked by scenes. 
So a weapon can be used for a certain number of scenes before its energy cell is depleted and has to be recharged. All right. So th so you're not go you're not going for a very micromanagey approach when it comes no, to no, no, ammunition no. management. Okay. No. Um. So running out of juice in the middle of a fight doesn't really happen much unless someone has deliberately drained power from your weapons. Yeah. All right. So the 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 next the next approach that I'm that I was that I'm curious about is if so, is um now get now obviously my moniker is the monk and if some and if somebody doesn't think that they that that pure old school monks in space it can't be a thing well then they haven't met me <laughs> so if somebody if somebody wanted to if somebody wanted to do the height, the idea of the tr of the traveling monk on the f on the frontier who does who doesn't use weapons because they because they've got plenty of weapon and ju and just their bare hands and feet, um, obviously they would obviously they would try and master unarmed. But how would you how would you reflect different types of um, fighting styles? So one of my players in a test game I'm running right now currently basically is Goku. From the way he fights, mm -hmm. so he's barehanded. He channels psionic energy into his fists to increase their damage, so that he can actually compete with weapon wielders and actually do damage to heavier armor. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and he can he can throw down with everybody else in their fancy gadgets. He doesn't need anything. <laughs> yeah. Um. And now, so, now, um, if somebody if if somebody want if somebody wanted to wanted to specialize in uh, specialize in unarmed, but but their but their particular combat style leaned more in the realm of say, um, muay th of muay thai or 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 taekwondo, one with one with a lot of a lot of close range kick, a lot of close range kicks and elbows and the like. Um, how would the how would the skill spread reflect that? So it wouldn't have like separate punch or kick actions. Unarmed uh, attacks, whether they're punches or kicks, are going to be under the fight action. Mm -hmm. But you will eventually, if you master it, be able to have differing effects. Like you can knock someone back with your attacks. You can uh, also use takedowns or grapples or disarm someone outright. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually, so if you did like a ta the takedown move is a reaction, you do it in response to someone attacking you to redirect their force and knock them down and or you know, so they don't actually hurt you. But the classic, uh, what is that uh, martial art? Aikido, I think it's called. Yes. Um, and when it com when when it comes to when it comes when it comes to um, the balancing between. Me between melee and ranged weapons, there are some games that handle it mostly well, and, so and some games, even though there is the option, someone go someone going melee is at a significant disadvantage. Um, what are what are the is there is there going to be that kind of situation where um, where melee is uh, is outclassed by firearms, or do or have you taken steps to make sure that they can be on even footing relatively? So generally speaking, melee attacks are always going to do more damage than ranged attacks. However, you have to also take into consideration that ranged attackers are going to be able to hit you multiple times before the melee attacker is going to be able to get into range. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it's going to depend on where the fight is taking place. If the fight is taking place on an open field, the melee character better have some tricks to cl close distance or pull someone closer or use stealth to sneak up because just walking up to them in a field, they're going to get shot down. Mm -hmm. However, aboard a starship with narrow corridors, yeah, melee characters are very dangerous there because they can pop out of a room right in front of you and you're in melee combat and, and you're a guy carrying a rifle which isn't suited for close range combat. <laughs> so it's it's very much dependent on where you are because they, they have different uses. So melee combat isn't just useless. It just, if you want to use it in certain circumstances, you have to plan how you're going to approach it. Yeah. And, and there's lots of ways to do that. 
That does bring me to an interesting thing that I saw when it came to the two types of damage, in the sense that um, you have armor and barrier, and unless mm -hmm. unless I misread it, um, barrier is completely useless against melee attacks. Correct. And I'm ge I'm guessing that was a conscious choice to make sure to make sure that people who have both armor and barrier don't get too confident in their tankiness. Uh, yes, and it was also to uh, kind of help with the power level of psionics to a degree, because a psionic character can put up some insane level of barrier. So, fighting a psionic person with a gun, unless it's a really big gun, you might be whittling down that barrier for a while. Mm -hmm. So you might want to bring along someone who can get in close to the psionic and go for the sword, sword kill, you know? Yeah. Now... When it comes to when it com when it comes to um, psionics, um, I've seen I've seen some instances of of psionic use where that where it's on where it's either strictly strictly a skill role. Sometimes sometimes it's using a resource, um, and uh, and other times it's a it's a role that ha that has a whole lot of risks. Um, when it comes to when it comes to psionics, are there are there any are there any um, specific rules that have that have to be taken into account besides it being a normal skill roll? So there is a morale system that determines some skills' abilities. Some some skills are more effective when you're at high morale. Some skills can only really be used uh, in those. Sometimes you have to spend morale to use certain abilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, psionics go, delves into that very heavily. Most things in psionics are going to relate to your morale or the target's morale in some way or another. And uh, so there's no uh, like pool. There's no there's no mana pool to to gauge. There's no limit in how many psionic abilities you can use, as long as you can manage its effects on your morale. Um, and since since you mentioned managing, the other question I had on that is. In some cases, there's there's some sort of rule for there's some sort of rule for uh, ma for supernatural backlash if somebody um, does not have the favor of RN Jesus because as the mantra he is here in the temple, the dice gods show no mercy. <laughs> um, is a example an example of this kind of thing would be um, perils of the warp in um, Warhammer Forty Thousand or um, Drain in um, Shadowrun. Um, is there anything in in that regard when it comes to psionics? Uh, no, not really. There's there's no real penalties for failure by default in the system for pretty much any of the skills. Mm -hmm. But there are certain conditions that you can be put into. Like one of them is a uh, despair condition, where you actually will uh, lose your morale when you fail, which is a state that a telepath can put someone in. Yep. Um. Now, a lot a lot of games ha a lot of games, especially games outside of the big two, tend to have some kind of extra effort or edit button kind of kind of um resource. Um, since I mentioned Shadowrun, that has an, that has the one in the form of Edge. Um, something like Eclipse Phase has it in Moxie. Um, the World of Darkness games have Willpower. Is there anything like that in Tangent Space? So what do these different uh, mechanics do specifically? Um, could you now they're they're in the same kind of family, but they tend but there's two popular approaches that they tend to go by, either an extra effort where you can you can spend it before you roll to give that roll a boost, um, or an okay. e or what I call an edit button where you can spend it to essentially take control of a of a scene or or insert some little factor into into a scene. Um, okay. Yeah. So in tangent space, it uses a simple luck system, mm -hmm. which is basically just to give uh, players a, a second chance for something. So every session, players get three luck. They can spend it on any roll they want, and if they get a roll that they really needed to work, and they get a really bad roll, they can spend one of their luck points to re-roll it, and they can only do that once per action. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a system to just show 
not show, but basically to give players a little more agency over what's important to their character. So if it's important, spend your luck and hope for the best. <laughs> um, you really sure you, sh you really sure you should be using the the H word in that case because I've I just said the dice gods show no mercy, and they love causing people pain. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah, um, it, it, they'll get a roll that's like, oh, that's not good enough. Let me roll again. And they roll a one. And it's like, well, there was your one re-roll and you're stuck with the one now, which is way worse. <laughs> I, um, I have, se I have, I have seen, I have seen cases where people will, where people in, in D20 based games, even though, even though the, the difficulty is way too high, they'll go, they'll go with the whole notion of, hey, I've, hey, I've got a 5% chance to, to crit, don't I? And they roll, and it's a natural one. <laughs> and I immediately have to turn my head so that nobody sees me laughing my head off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes people do overestimate their chances with those luck rolls. It's that's, like, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> that's why I say, I, I personally believe that the that the dice gods or RN Jesus, whichever you want to call it, is a mo is a model example of true equality because it doesn't matter it does not matter your social status race sex sexual identification ethnicity background height weight the dice gods hate you and want you to suffer <laughs> which is mainly why put that mechanic in there just to give the poor players a little bit more of an edge when they're mm -hmm. trying to not fall down a um, chasm <laughs> and that that does bring me to another question regard in regard to combat and that is the general um squishiness of pl of players um now obviously this is something that can be mit that can be mitigated with equipment but is it what is it one of those cases where a couple good hits will put them in the dirt or can they t can they take a few before they should start getting cautious it is very much a system where if you're being hit by a modern weapon and you are not wearing any sort of defenses there's not a whole lot that your meaty body is going to do <laughs> to protect you against that so the average the average person not wearing anything, if they get shot with a pistol, there's a good chance that they're going to be harmed by it. Maybe a couple shots and they're down, you know? It's mm -hmm. just, they're not going to be able to take much. But the armor and defensive systems that you can get in the game are strong enough to the point where you can build a very tanky character that's wearing powered armor with auto barrier systems and just wades into combat and is only really looking out for the guy with the rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. Now... One thing that one thing that I found interesting when I looked at the equipment section in the in the um, I guess I'll call it alpha is things like gene mods and cyber augments. And being a connoisseur of cyberpunk, I am no I am no stranger to uh, to you to augmentation rules. And in a lot of those in a lot of those cases, they there will be some sort of penalty. Or some sort of some sort of gradual cost when it comes to augmenting yourself in that fashion. Um, the poster child for this kind of thing is humanity in, um, or rather not humanity, but empathy in um, Cyberpunk 2020 and now Cyberpunk Red, where too much where um, too much cyberizations basically turns you into a cyber zombie. Um, is the, is there a, is there a similar kind of catch in in this instance, or is it just the case of cybernetics ain't cheap? So, this is very much a the body is just a vehicle for the mind. So it doesn't really matter what body you're you're trucking around in. It's mostly up to what body you want to have, which is a very transhuman kind of you know notion. But that's the point where technology is, where it doesn't really have any negatives to doing these body modifications, because in the end, you're still you on the inside, even if you're currently a uh, mind uploaded into a tank. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, the only uh, 
the only thing you have to keep in mind is that the more you modify your body, the progressively more expensive it becomes. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're going the cybernetic route instead of the genetic engineering route, you're going to get less of an effect from biological restoration. And you're going to have to start being repaired as if you were like an android. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'd I'd imagine I'd imagine that the GM might put some penalties because so because um somebody somebody having a mach a machine for a lower jaw is probably going to be a little disturbing when trying to do polite conversation. Also depend on where you are because uh, if you're in the core worlds, they see stuff like that all the time. It's not a, really a shocker for them. I mean, they'll interact with a giant machine and. This is the, you know, Ambassador Clank from Proxima 4, and it's just this giant hulking brick, and it's like, that's the Ambassador, you know? So, they, uh, it, it, in the core worlds, it wouldn't be as much of an issue, but if you were to some place that, you know, is pretty isolated and they don't really deal much with machines and cybernetics there, yeah, they might be a little creeped out by it, because it's not something they see in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. Now... I want to sh I want to segue into ship combat. Okay. Um. Now, when it co when it comes to the when it comes to that, um, this is a tr this ends up being a tricky thing for so for some get for some games because a lot of a lot of times it ends up getting bo ends up getting bogged down. Um. Is ship co could is ship combat fairly similar to boots on ground combat, or does it have it does it have its own quirks in terms of how it operates? So the well, one of my biggest things when I decided I was going to include vehicles and starships is that I wanted the systems for characters and vehicles to be as similar as I possibly could because it's, I'm already asking them to learn a whole new system with my game. I don't want to ask them to learn two. <laughs> so the, it is a three-tiered system. You have the character tier, the vehicle tier, and the starship tier. Mm -hmm. And they, the vehicle and starship tier, they are very similar to one another, but they also borrow very heavily from the way things work with characters. So everything is still skills based. Uh, the so if you're wanting to fire a weapon on your starfighter, you're going to be using the same gunnery skill that you use to use a mounted turret on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a technician and you want to use a starship sensors, you're going to be using the exact same analysis skill that you use as a character. So someone who's spent all his time developing their analysis skill, doing scans in some ancient ruins, they're going to be able to use those exact same skills to run a starship sensors. All right. And, and so, uh, yeah, so it was a very big focus for me was trying to deviate in as few places as possible mm -hmm. to the point where I even had it so that modules can be installed into vehicles to let you do even more of your character level skills. How would you like to not have a ship have any physical weapons, but you can just channel your psionic energy through your starfighter? Which is some is something that is not is not considered even by even by even by the bigger entries when it comes to um when it comes to science, when it comes to science fiction, um, the idea the idea of some of psionics t playing a part in the in the util in the utilization of certain ships. Um, I mean, the yeah, I mean, getting imagine having a telepath plugged into your you know star cruiser, and now that telepath is messing with the minds of the entire crew of an enemy ship. Either either that or helping facilitate helping facilitate communication with the with the entire crew. Or yeah, there's like a jamming field and nobody can send signals. Well, we'll just plug the telepath into there, get into your uh your psionic couch, and just uh, send some mental waves to that other ship over there that we're trying to talk to. <laughs> Although when it comes when it comes to engineering, I may or may not implement a house rule that whoever's play whoever's playing engineering has to speak with a bad spot bad Scottish accent. <laughs> uh, it's just tradition. <laughs> well, a long time, a long time ago, when I was when I was running the, when I was running FASA Star Trek, I had put I had put in a unwritten rule that that um so, that somebody could get a bonus to their dice roll based on how ridiculous their techno babble could get. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of techno babble, I actually <laughs> incorporated some Star Trek techno babble into actual skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw that. You 
don't think don't think I didn't notice the whole reverse the polarity thing you put in. Yep. <laughs> um, now when now um when it comes when it comes to the when it came to, when it came to um the starship level approach um one now this quest this question I'm mainly bringing up because one game that I have been enjoying um a lot a lot over the years is a lip is a little game made by a few people called Star Sector and okay the question that I have for this it is one that some one that some SF games have struggled with and that is you and that is doing um engagements between small fleets instead of engagements of say a, a half dozen ships all, all at once but small small fleets i.e some some sort of capital ship es escorts and the like can would the starship level combat be able to handle that so that's actually two different systems so starship combat already in and of itself is it, it borrows some of the things from the other tiers mm -hmm. but starship level is more abstracted it's more of a set piece so you could be doing all sorts of other actions before you even roll one turn of the starship level combat yeah. because that's more of a it's it's a larger scale and we're talking gigantic starships fighting over vast distances where you could never even see your opponent looking out a window so uh the starship tier is m very abstract so that said, there's also grand combat mechanics. Grand combat is where there's any large-scale fight happening that you don't want to track each and every individual piece. All right. And it's very focused on major narrative moments. Mm -hmm. So it's less going to be trading blows, but it's going to be more how is the tide of battle turning? You know what what you know events are happening that the player characters need to address so that the you know the scales don't tip against them in this giant conflict mm -hmm. and that works for ground combat it works for starship combat grand combats anytime there's a lot of stuff going on and you don't want to track all each individual piece all right i i can i can certainly um i can certainly get that and it is and um oddly enough that sort of that sort of large scale mass combat is not is not touched upon as as much as one as much as one would think. You think you think that more games would would do it, but I'll, I can only think of a handful that have made that have made the attempt, and I'm obviously not counting existing games that had that had it that had it um, house ruled in by fans. Yeah, it's just when you're doing space opera, big space battles happen. I mean, it's you're going to have the entire galaxy coming together to fight the reapers, you know? It's you got to have some way to abstract that out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just going to be kind of, you know, unsatisfying to the players when they finally get to this big moment and there's nothing, there's no mechanics prepared for them to actually see it happen, yeah. you know? So, it was that was something that I really had to work on. Mhm. Mm because it's if you don't have enough it won't feel good but if you have too much it just becomes a slog and it just the whole the whole session grinds to a halt so i went very heavy into the narrative focus just focus on what matters what is going to be you know epic for the players to experience and when it when when it comes to the, when it comes to that kind of that kind of fe that kind of feeling of it of it being an epic um in with within a lot within a lot of within a lot of games and a lo and a lot of science and a lot of science fiction approaches you te you tend to have a you tend to have a cast that is that is of some rank of some respon of some responsibility but in in the case of something like mass effect they're still do they're still doing on ground things even though they're a, even though they're the commander of a ship, for instance, um, when it comes to t when it comes to tangent space, how how do you address the notion of what of what particular angles could could be used to to go out adventuring when it com when it comes to um, pe when it comes to people in the core worlds and people in the frontier, and obviously out in the frontier, that's going to be a little bit easier. People are trying to claim a stake. Mm -hmm. Um. There's of course the whole exploration, you know, the five-year mission and all that. But 
what other angles ha have you have you considered putting in, say, a GM section regarding a impetus for people to go out for people to go out into the world? So for even in the core world areas, so you don't have to go all the way out into the frontier to experience danger to experience the unknown because the galaxy is a huge place so even the claimed areas of the galaxy are not fully explored down to every planet so there might be an uh, archaeological expedition it's like hey there's this planet we surveyed 30 years ago somebody went by and they noticed something the original survey missed you send a team there and all of a sudden there's this you know secret ruin from one of the precursors that's been down here this whole time and now you have this whole adventure built around why was it here why did they never find it or you could end up having it where there is internal conflict like mm -hmm. maybe there's been a uh a political upheaval inside one of the nations and it's you know threatening the you know new piece that's you know been built and now you're playing uh, agents of the Star League trying to figure out what's causing this internal strife in one of our members and, you know, trying to get to the source of it. And there might be, you know, nefarious forces at work that are trying to destabilize things from within. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be even completely uh, political-based campaigns. If that's your jam, you could have a Babylon 5-style romp where most of it is just managing large-scale conflicts and disagreements on a more... Uh, political level. I mean, I tried to design it to cover all the bases of what happens in s the space operas that I liked. Mm -hmm. And so, even in the core worlds, there's a lot you can get into. There's also a lot of factions in the game that all have their own goals and motivations that you can get involved with them. And they, and they sometimes work alongside each other. Sometimes they directly oppose each other. And you could be all sorts of different... Uh, of these, what do you call them, like heroic archetypes that you see in other space opera and sci-fi shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that there are some factions who have the attitude of, I hate you, but I hate I hate that guy more, so truce, we'll kill each other later. Yeah, there's, there's like one faction that nobody really likes, the Ouroboros, because they're assassins, and they basically have people that can predict the future and say this person is going to be a problem, they need to be eliminated, and guess what? Everybody else is mad about that, you can't go after somebody for something they haven't done yet and mm -hmm. that's their whole shtick and <laughs> great now i'm getting flashbacks of the of the lut of the Luttic path from star sector who are ba are basically anti-technology terrorists who hate everybody and everybody hates them <laughs> yeah well they're definitely a uh uh, a misunderstood faction. They they do believe they're doing what's best for the galaxy. It's just their methods put them on the bad side of a lot of other groups. And we actually have one in uh, my current playtest group, and she's having a lot of fun with that. <laughs> um, which, um, when it comes, one of the one particular thing that I've been that I've been exploring often on in in some of my campaigns is putting is putting mechanical hooks. When so when somebody has some degree of of um, rank, whether it, whether that be political, whether that be military, whether that be rank within rank within a certain a certain settlement or just so, or just some sort of social rank, is something is something like that a thing a thing that's been considered? So that already exists within the factions, mm -hmm. which are uh, their major groups that aren't tied to any specific star nation. Um, and there's also planned for other major groups in the galaxy, but that part has not yet been written. But it is something that is planned. All right. Now, with that with that said, how how big are you how big are you shooting when it comes to this book as far as its um, page count? Because the de the demo version is already pretty beefy as it is at 190 pages. Oh, oh goodness. Um... It's probably going to be somewhere in the 400 plus page range, because uh, I'm already at about 300 in the uh, the alpha version, and that doesn't even have the whole uh, the lore section of the book written. It doesn't have all the NPCs that I'm putting in there written, so it's it's going to be pretty hefty. <laughs> well, when I'd say I'd say when you're when you're dealing with trying to present a whole new universe. 
um, heftiness is inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I especially uh, kick myself when I realize, oh no, the relic section is taking up a huge chunk of the game all by itself. <laughs> and with that, with that kind, with and I'll cer I'll certainly be looking forward to how e how everything develops um, on my own on my own end with the te with the temple, especially since I ha especially since. Most of us, most of us here are giant weaves and giant nerds all, all in one. And there's, n and there's nothing stopping me from interpreting the vehicle rules to get to make to make somebody pilot a mech. <laughs> the mechs are already a part of the game. Oh, that ma that makes my job easier. <laughs> yeah, uh, mechs in tangent space use a neural interface. So when you're piloting a mech, the mech will do whatever you physically are capable of doing. So if you're a master of athletics, you can have a mech that is jumping around and doing flips. If you're a master of marksman, you're probably going to have a mech with a big gun that you can shoot. So it's it a mech is like a hybrid of the character and vehicle tiers put together. When you meant when you mentioned neural interface, the first thing that came to mind was G Gundam. <laughs> oh. I sure ho I sure hope that they're not gonna have to. Well, then again, it could it could be worse. You could be dealing with um pi with piloting um, um mech warriors where you where um you're gonna be wearing almost nothing because of the heat. Uh yeah, this is a a very very high tech uh setting. So heat management they they've got that figured out. You'll you'll be comfy in your little pilot seat. <laughs> but. With all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh sure, absolutely. And it's been fun. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for more tangent space or just to geek out or just to um f or just to take pity on on the diehard defenders of Voyager, um the door is always <laughs> open. Or, or if you prefer, okay. make fun of anybody who likes Enterprise. Oh, the potential. Um, <laughs> as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>